Hi there, local citizens. Welcome back to the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around manifesting a new world. I am your host, Lauren Sadu, coming to you from a rainy afternoon here in the streets of Accra. And you know what's interesting? I keep talking about this Harmonton, Harmonton, Harmonton. It is officially over now. This rain right now is like a daytime soaker. We've been having some like piddly, 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 like nighttime showers the last couple of nights. But I believe right now we are full force, full effect in raining season. I mean, in the, the short raining season. So my guest was just telling me about the, the seasons of rain. And so we're in the short raining season before the longer one, which is in what most of us in the Northern hemisphere consider summer. So in any case, I'm so excited to be having this conversation today because this is one of the first people that I've worked with here in Ghana comes full circle. And it's just, it's a great opportunity just to kind of sit down and talk about his work and our work. And let me just get straight to his bio. He is the founder and the creative director of Animax FYB Studios in Ghana. An award-winning filmmaker, he is trained in a number of different cinematic mediums and has over 10 years experience in the audiovisual industry. He is a member of the International Academy of Arts and Sciences, Emmy, a jury at MIPCOM in Cannes, and a frequent speaker on different film and television forums around the world. He was shortlisted for the 42nd Student Academy Awards at the Oscars and won Best Animation Film at the Africa International Film Festival in 2016. He won Best Creative Artist in 2017 at the Black British Entertainment Awards. Animator of the Year at the 2017 Ghana UK based awards at Scuba, and also Best Animation at the 2018 Ghana Movie Awards. So you get the idea, folks. He's pretty, pretty, pretty hot stuff. In 2019, Face to Face Africa named him one of the five African animators who can give their Hollywood counterparts a run for their money. And he is. And his Mofa channel, which is what we collaborate, we've collaborated on, is a 70 minute children's variety program which debuted on Amazon Prime, making him the first African animation producer to achieve such a feat. <laughs> In 2021, his short 3D animated film, Room 5, was nominated at the Annecy International Animation Film Festival, making him the only West African director to be nominated for the year and one out of four films for Africa. He is a regular feature at Meta Cinema Forum, the largest Africa and Middle East film and cinema convention. He is also a planning committee member and artistic director of the Afrotino Music Festival, where Latino and African performers will be meeting in a series of cross-country con concerts in Panama, Costa Rica, Colombia, and Mexico. Francis Brown. Uh, hello. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, I'm so happy to host you. Okay, so let's jump right in. Let's get started. Where are you from? Where are you local? And what is your craft? So I'm from Takrade, the western region called the western part of Ghana, southwestern. I moved to Accra to uh, school. Yeah, so I schooled at Nafti and um, now I'm a local at uh, East Ligon in Accra. But it's very hard for me to say I'm a local now anywhere because I move around a lot. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. My craft, my work is art. So I'm a creative director and um, I specialize in filmmaking, more in animation productions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And so Growing up in Takradi and coming and, and deciding to come to do to study at NAFTI, and NAFTI is the film and television school here in Ghana. When did you realize that you were a creative? So this is something that it, it was right from childhood. Uh, it was very easy for me to know what I, I wanted to do as a person. I was born an artist and it was also nurtured by my grandmother when she saw that particular interest and also ability. She made sure that I was always making art. Because I was making art up 
anything that came my way as of the time. I was making woodcraft, I was making uh, ceramics with clay. Yes, I was, I was uh, creating blocks out of cement that I found around. I was drawing in my jotters and uh, tracing sheets. Mm. So I was an all-rounder. I was actually also making um, as tools for my grandmother to use, okay. carpentry. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so I was a handyman, basically. Sure. So everything with your tactile. Basically. Uh -huh. yes. Okay. Okay. So then how, okay. So then when you decided that you wanted to study an NAPTI, did you know that you wanted to now become an animator or you were just, you know, thinking? Oh, I knew I wanted to be an animator even before I went to the high school. Oh, okay. Yes. But when I was going to the high school, I selected that's uh, St. John's school based in second D Takrade. I selected visual art as the course that I wanted to study and through that I wanted to also go to a film school to uh, further my knowledge and also ability in filmmaking to be able to produce animations. So I knew it from the very onset. Okay. Yeah. So what were your favorite cartoons growing up? Uh, my favorite cartoons was uh, SWAT Cat. SWAT Cat? Yes. Okay, was that out of the UK? Uh, SWAT Cat was from uh, America, basically. Really? Yes. I'm, I have no recollection of SWAT Cat. Yes, yeah, SWAT Cat. <laughs> and also um, Johnny Quest. Okay, yes. 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 Johnny Quest Definitely was Johnny also Quest. one of the animations that I really loved. Okay, okay, okay. Interesting. So now, how would you describe your animation style? My animation style, I've named it Coliko. Coliko? Yeah, Coliko. Okay. And uh, from where I'm from, uh, Takradi or the western part or the fancy side of the land, Coliko literally means puppetry. Mm. So, and puppetry oh, yes. is also another form of animation. Right. And um, I want to believe that as the Asians have anime, mm -hmm. uh, the French have their own style, yeah. which is heavy and uh, puppetry and cutouts. Oh, yeah. America has yeah. their Disney style animation. We as Africans, we need to also have our unique style and uh, something that would be very distinctive. Okay. Hence, couching the name Coleco for my animation style, which I've seen a couple of friends adopting oh. the idea. Okay. So which of, so, you know, oftentimes the client dictates what style you end up using, right? So which of your works is in that style now? Which is my work? My work, um, Room 5, actually, is, is, that style? is, is the style mm -hmm. for Coleco. Uh, Coleco, to me, uh, is the style that when you see, the movements are very fluid, but at the same time, it is more about the elements that you see in the picture, in the mm -hmm. visual narrative and sometimes the audio. Mm -hmm. I would like to uh, say that when you see the characters, you immediately point at Africa, saying that, mm -hmm. oh, these are African characters, their features, their faces, their noses, their, their, their mouth, how they sound. And when they talk, you should be able to know that this character is coming from either Nigeria or Ghana or South Africa. Mm -hmm. That is how I want Coleco to be built. Mm, okay, okay, got it, so room five. Would you also say that, so looking at Mofra Channel, which of the, um, I think one of the, and so people can watch it and see, because right. room five is not necessarily distributed, but you can, people definitely can find um, Mofra on Amazon Prime. So which of those is in that style? So I would say Zina the Zebra is in that style. Yeah. Way to go is also okay. in that style. Yeah. Zina the zebra is, in terms of the characters, zebras uh, can be attributed to Africa more. Yeah. And also the voices, when you yeah. hear the voices, you can tell that these are authentic sure. African voices. Sure. And if you listen to it closely, then you can easily identify Ghana as the voice that you are hearing. Mm -hmm. Way to go to as well. Uh, if you look at the 
children in the, the Karates, they were wearing a local school uniform that we call Kokonte and Abenkwan. So if you're from this <laughs> side, Ghana. Yeah, yeah, you you just know that oh, this is made in Ghana, or we are trying to depict Ghanaian students. Yeah. Yes, so that that is how I think through what we create, how to represent our characters. Sure, sure, sure. So let me, before I, I want to get more into some of the inspirations and process around both Mofra and Red Room 5. Yeah. But before then, because you've kind of mentioned it, why the where? So you finish studying and, and one thing he didn't mention is his first film was also award winning. And so that actually started, like, in Monty's career, and that was while he was still at NAFTI. Yeah. And so the, the world was open to you. Yeah. So why the where? How did you come to be living, working, and playing where you currently are located? So, I mean, you said it right. Right from school, I was, I was more like a, a school star. Mm -hmm. my, my films were already winning international film festivals, mm -hmm. even as a student. Yeah. And, um, so which, which is the one that you had the first premiere for? Yes, Agrada. Agra uh -huh. Yes, Agrada. And um, also then followed up was Agokoli. Agokoli, yeah. Yes, my graduation film. And um, I, I got the opportunity to work in some good studios outside of the country. And um, I was struck by, I was in a course where thinking through leaving the country or the continent and um, exporting my talent, I was staying back in Ghana and create what is not there. And I think for the love of my people and also for the love of what I'm doing, it made it very clear for me to stay. Yeah. Even though I didn't have the capital to start my studio mm -hmm. or have any animation studio that I could easily join and say, hey, this is what I can do. So I'm supporting you with my craft. So it meant that I was going to start a full-time, the very first full-time animation studio in Ghana all by myself mm -hmm. with no business idea, <laughs> no entrepreneurial skills. Sure. Uh, just jumped into it. So. Yeah. As a creative, I became an accidental entrepreneur. Mm, right, right, right. So it really was driven by wanting to do it here. Yes, and doing it with my people because when I was at film school, I was always advocating for uh, producing authentic films, African films, Ghanaian films. And we were always saying we should tell our stories, we should tell our stories, but I realized that the few of us who had the opportunity to leave the country or export our talent mm -hmm. took that uh, opportunity over the idea that we want to tell our own stories. Mm -hmm. And to me, it felt like selling out. And I couldn't sell out because I believe that if we create it here at some point, our voices will be heard and we won't be so gutted seeing foreigners creating content for us that doesn't depict who we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good motivation. So you started us talking about how you started up mm -hmm. on your entrepreneurial journey. So, I mean, I'll give you all a little bit of background. So I met Francis early on, early days when I started Leap and we worked together on the first what was our first project? Our first project had this lizard in it. Oh, uh, Barima. The, yeah, yeah. Barima. It yeah, was the we started with the yeah. Sesame Street. Right, getting preparing yeah. for Sesame Workshop types of types of animation. So we worked on that, and and then you got big. <laughs> 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 because what he's what he's leaning out is, you know, well, well, we'll talk about it. So you being a creative and starting your own studio, how did you then get the capital? How did you raise the funds? Yeah, so you see, as I said, as a child, I was multi-talented. I could literally create anything and everything if I set my mind on it. Once it is a creative piece, I'm able to do that. So when I was at film school, 
one thing I actually did, I paid my own school fees. I, I was taking care of myself. And um, how I was doing that was through running gigs for t-shirt printing, a print t-shirt. I was working on videography for wedding occasions, uh, people's parties. I was shooting short films. I was designing, I was a graphic designer. So these skill sets helped me a lot when I came out because then I was trading off the skill set to make the income that will support me to buy my equipment and have the space to bring in uh, people to support there. Right, right, right. So the hustle. So I leveraged on all the yeah. talents that I had yeah. to create it. Yeah. yeah. And so you, you, have, you did develop a, 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 a niche of some sort working with development agencies, right? So that also, and tell us more about that and how those kind of projects became a big part of what the studio has been has done in the past right so there was also this thing where i didn't i didn't like the idea of uh, producing commercials mm -hmm. like uh, fast moving commodity commercials because i felt like uh, these commercials doesn't really have weight and the the, the expiry date is too short Mm -hmm. They don't have longevity. No, no evergreenness. Yes. Um, once the campaign is done, your creativity, your effort is done. They shelve it and you move on to the next. And for me, the, the start wasn't so much about the money. It was about the passion and also to show what we can truly produce. So I found that, that these NGOs and multinationals are the ones who were also looking for such uh, projects to produce narratives, you know, telling stories in animation form, not just uh, some 60 minutes or 30 minutes duration. So as my final year production, the graduation film was winning lots of awards. This gave me an opportunity to have calls from uh, UNICEF, World Food Program, to pitch for some of their contracts that they have in the animation space and uh, this opened me up to all the UN organizations and they were also recommending me to other uh, organizations such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to work with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your work spoke for it yourself? Basically. Yeah. The studio is 10 years now and we've never had any proper or any advertisement anywhere mm -hmm. to promote the studio. It has always been about word of mouth and also recommendation. So l let's talk about the studio. 10 years and you have, so tell us about the team, how you came about putting it together because it's truly a pan-African right. effort. So tell us, tell us about it, recruiting, all of that. How do, how do you, because we don't have a ton of animators, we don't have a ton right. of great animators. So, so tell us about how you're thinking about that and some of the future forward things that you've done to support. Yes, so you see, the thing is, when I started up with Animax FYB Studios, my main aim was to collaborate with other creatives who were having the same ideas I do, not exporting the talent, staying here to create great stuff. I quickly came to realize that there weren't a lot of or enough refined talent as myself, like skilled people who truly understand the pipeline and also the way animation works in general. So I was forced to move out of Ghana, not move as in move locations, but move around to find uh, like-minded people and also people who had the same type of skill sets, who understand what they're doing and to bring them together. So I became like a Professor X, mm. going around <laughs> looking for talent. Um, he took me to lots of African countries, but I ended up collaborating with folks from Uganda, Nigeria, Rwanda, South Africa, Kenya, uh, Senegal. I was able to bring some of these talents into Ghana sure. to come and help me build the studio because we needed that and uh, what we did was we didn't just bring these foreigners into the country I won't even call them foreigners I'll say my African brothers and sisters into Ghana to help us establish the studio but also 
using their talent to teach the young ones who are coming in. So we had students always coming from the different universities that we have for internship, for national service placement, and they were learning under these guys who came around. So quickly, we started having people who could go out there and are Ghanaians and can say, I can produce animation on this standard or on this level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And so I'm going to guide you a little bit because you're, you're leaving out a big thing that you just did last year, right. which was a partnership between the studio yes. and the French, yes. a French studio. So tell us about that, that partnership and how it came about because it's truly really about this impact, taking it that much further and, and tell us about your vision. Basically, mm -hmm. yes, the lack of uh, trained talent, as I was saying earlier on, that made me bring in other nationalities and um, to help us build up. But once again, to every stage, there is its own limit. Mm -hmm. So it got to a point where I also realized that not all of these guys who came around have one, maybe the interest to train the the new talents or the new generations coming in, uh, but also might be having limited abilities to uh, share. Um, so what did I do? I was thinking about the next level idea. So the next level idea is to really train people by using professionals and by so doing the, the thinking and also searching led me to the number one animation school in the world, that is uh, Goblin. Um, when I wanted to go to an animation school or film school to learn, Goblin was the school that I wanted to go. But unfortunately, I didn't have the finances to go. So they have been in my thought and in my wish for a very long time to either train or partner with them on something. At this stage, it became a stage where it's, it's just going to be about the partnership. So it means that I moved above training myself in their space to them becoming my actual partners in the business, in mm -hmm. the industry. Yeah, all good and well. I was able to secure that partnership where in the 67 or 69 years in their existence, they've never ever done anything outside of their campus before with any European or American or Asian country wow. or studio. Uh, Ghana and Animax became the first and uh, they came around to train. And when we were training, we were training about 16 people. But even as we were training the 16 people, we had different people coming from different West African countries. So we had uh, two people from Nigeria, we had someone from Benin, we had someone from Ivory Coast joining us. So it became like a West African connect instead of just training the Ghanaian youth. Right, right, right. I guess part of that is the Francophone connection. Yes. And, and this was, in a sense, it was a public-private partnership to a, to a degree because the French... The uh, French embassy helped us, um, they were our liaison. Sure. They liaised between ourselves and the school, and they helped us, like, they really helped us in connecting, introducing us, and also part funding the training. And um, we also had EU, the delegation of EU to Ghana, also funding the project. And the main idea is to keep training and expanding this training session into a full-blown animation school where we can say that you don't need to gather lots of money to travel outside of the continent to go train. Mm -hmm. So you need to just come to Ghana or be in Ghana and come to Animax Coleco Institute. That's the name. <laughs> nice. So once again, Coleco, okay. Okay. Coleco Institute to train. Okay, nice, 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 nice. So talking about the, the Pan-African mix, of, of people that you've collaborated with, I want to ask about Glocal Speak. So please share a word, a phrase, or a saying that is a meaningful part of your local experience and why or how you've come to value it as Glocal Speak. Okay, so uh, it is almost, it is, in fact, I have two. I have Aze, that is my own people, the Fantis. Okay, Fantis. Uh, uh -huh. We say Aze, which in Accra you say Chale. 
So oh, okay. My man, like I didn't that, know that. Yeah, so we have Aze. Aze. So uh -huh. if you hear Aze, it means that it's coming from either the central region or the western region. Okay, Aze. Uh -huh. And yeah, and so it's fancy. I used to say that a lot. Yes, it's okay. fancy. And um, I found myself saying Omo a lot because I was going to Nigeria a lot. I made oh, lots of I was Nigerian say, that friends. Nigerian. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And the studio too, I was working with a bunch of Nigerians, yeah. um, so I was always saying Omo, Omo, Omo. Okay, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And so what does Omo mean for our listeners? Omo, Omo means a whole lot of things. Yeah, like, like Chale. It's same. just like Chale. Yeah. It, it depends on the tone. Context. And oh, okay. also uh -huh. how, yeah, the context, yeah. how you pronounce it. Basically. And now that's a Yoruba name, a Yoruba word. Omo, Omo would, you would say Yoruba, but everyone or uses pigeon. it it's very yeah it's pigeon it's, okay. it's universal sure sure yeah. sure 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 okay yeah so the we have houses some... use it the ebos use uh -huh. it your okay. best use it okay so we have some translations for chale yes aze aze and omo and omo yeah. yeah so the three of them all in, about the same yeah, all about this okay the same. those are good 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 local speaks so you know you have these works you have you know mofra channel so i want let, let's kind of go back to mofra and then yeah. the the concept of distribution right. right because that's that's a big thing like we have all these creatives particularly in the visual arts and the first thing people think is oh youtube yeah. which is sure it's fine but youtube has algorithms and it's already you know going viral whatever what have you but let's talk about how first of all mofra came about and then just overall with with your works room five how how do you how you first of all get into the award space like get visibility and then what is distribution like yeah okay so uh one thing about what we do as uh, producers and uh, filmmakers you might be able to produce something very beautiful and you lose out on distribution because perhaps the film hasn't really won itself or the project hasn't won itself notoriety in the industry yeah. and um, distributors will be quick to distribute a film that has been to a Khan mm -hmm. or a Nancy or Annie yeah. and it doesn't even necessarily have to win the award but once it's been selected shows that it has the merit mm -hmm. it, it can really grab the attention of audience so I decided that um, we was going to produce award-winning stuff as a strategy uh, yes as the mm -hmm. strategy mm -hmm. so that is the first distribution strategy sure. to go into film festivals mm -hmm. to build the name and also the reputation for the studio mm -hmm. and uh, myself as a director and uh, through that we were able to now locate one or two distributors and uh, these distributors so people are always thinking Oh, they're distributing to Netflixes, the Disney's, the Amazon Primes, the Hulu's. Yes, these are the big chains. These are the big, they are the giants of distribution when it comes to uh, streaming. But then there are also independent and some very good uh, distributors who might even be paying more mm -hmm. uh, because of mm -hmm. their business models. Sure. So we found ourselves with some of the small distributors who have OTT platforms. Okay, and so, OTT is? Uh, OTT platforms are like uh, basically like uh, streamers. Yeah. Yeah, SOVDs, yes. <laughs> yes, so pay, uh, paid subscription platforms. So these ones come through. As we are building with them, we are also looking at how best to get to the bigger ones. Because sure. you need to build from somewhere. Mm -hmm. It only, like, it will take out of 10 people or 100 people i must say uh you might find just one or 10 people getting the opportunity to have their content distributed to uh, platforms like the netflixes and all that so what happens to the 99 or right. the 90 content sitting there yeah. so through festivals then true to get in the platforms okay and so now i'll start with mofra <laughs> so so mofra is a great project we worked on together and a lot of the inspiration 
is from the idea of Sesame Street because it's a it's a variety show. So where we what we focused on was creating programs for ages two to adolescents, so two to twelve, thirteen, and so we have eight. Yeah, eight shows. Eight shows in in this variety hour, and so we worked together on most of them, actually, if not if not yeah, all of them. Well, yeah, almost the whole, all yeah, of them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and so it was really our effort to, okay, no one's coming and in, in really investing in educational content for, ki for kids in right. Ghana. And so we created the pilot to do so. And then Francis did an immaculate job of then getting it onto Amazon Prime. So, so how, did that, how did that happen? How did you decide that that was what your focus was and then the mechanics of making it happen? Yeah. Uh, if you remember, you realize that when we started working on Mafra, mm -hmm. started working on it somewhere around 2018. Yeah. And um, it was shelved for a while because mm -hmm. the studio needed to make money. Yeah. Because uh, Mafra is, is our own yes. uh, project. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we needed to be sustainable in a way where we can use some of that to produce yeah yeah in both and, cases like i yes. use funds from doing the distribution projects exactly for, yeah, grant yeah. Mm -hmm. for productions so when it happened we just we just shelved it because there wasn't enough funds to move it forward yeah. but something happened what happened was covid yes. uh, covid happened and we we lost all the gigs that we had as at the time all the organizations were pulling out from whatever they wanted to do because they didn't know what's going on. They wanted to understand the future, basically. It felt like the world was ending. So I also started panicking because there wasn't anything or funds for the studio as of the time. So the small funds that we had, what we did was to revisit Mofra and said, I mean, it was my intuition that spoke to me or came to me in a way where it's like, oh, you were working on this project and um, you shelved it. Maybe this is the time to revisit it. And I didn't understand. So I was delaying a bit. I was thinking to either to keep the small funds that we have and tell the guys that, hey, you know what? You got to go. You got to go. Right. When everything settles, then Come back. we regroup. <laughs> yeah. But I was also looking at how some of these guys weren't from the country. So when they leave, it will be very hard to bring them back. And it will also feel like uh, you left them when things became hard, like you're becoming an opportunist or something. And that's not in my nature. So I said, OK, we're going to stay in this because we're already housing the talent. Yeah. And once we are already housing ourselves and they say lockdown, let's use the energy that we have and the small resource that we have to produce what we wanted to produce, that's uh, Mofra. And as we were producing, I was also on the internet a lot, trying to find those who can help us distribute this. And um, we got a distributor based in New York who said he can help us. And one time he came and said, we have a platform for it. so. We should go and I said, which platform? I said, <laughs> Amazon Prime. <laughs> Et voila. Yeah. So that was good. Yeah. That was a happy time because it motivated everyone in the studio. Yeah. And um, it really validated what we do here sure. because for some of these platforms, it's not just a matter of getting your content on it. Mm -hmm. The vetting process that you go mm -hmm. through. It means that we are definitely producing content quality. that is quality, exactly. yes. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you can find the pilot for Mofra Channel on Amazon Prime. And, uh, yeah, let's, we, we got to do more. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so this brings me to the, so now thinking about, what are the challenges to actually getting distribution and and really getting you know the funding for production so we're this is this is something that ever since i've come here we this is an everyday thing how do we how do we get people to recognize and value african-made content for ourselves because we go to these conferences 
and the marketplace is selling telenovelas and <clears throat> Bollywood dramas. That's where those are the cheap, low-hanging fruit. There's a little bit more of um, South African dramas that are also in the marketplace for the most part. But when it comes to anything educational and outside of like Nollywood films, we're not seeing that kind of uptick. They're not buying it. So most of our local local television, free-to-air televisions. Um, stations are buying that content and that's what we're seeing in the marketplace and they've literally said it's too expensive to invest in what you're investing in so how are we cracking that nut how are we moving beyond that so uh, it's a thing of you see this particular question is loaded yeah We, we there's different layers to it where we have to first of all reinvest into ourselves mm-hmm. as a people mm-hmm. because the Bollywood films and series that we watch on our telenovelas that we watch um, are as a result of their film funds exactly. supporting them exactly. and as they are getting this support the local investors are also seeing that there is some yeah. sort of value there so they are also investing into it and it helps them to produce in quantity mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that quantity, they flood the market with it because once you have it in bulk, they're able to reduce their cost and also spread it around like worldwide. Mm-hmm. And with that, they're able to get their returns. But we don't really have, first of all, a lot of um, investment coming in. So it, it definitely sometimes affects the quality sure. yeah. and also quantity. So we are not able to extend our project and it becomes limited edition content. And once you have limited content, it automatically makes it expensive Mm -hmm. because you want to mark up, you want to really get your returns. Mm -hmm. So you need to price it to make sense. Mm -hmm. And locally, we don't have the, the muscle to lift such projects for distribution yeah. and if you look at to when you go international you're also not going to get it because there's already a benchmark for some of these right. content exactly. quality quantity yeah. and we, we so you lose out right from get-go mm-hmm. right from you looking for production investment to who, who producing and distributing right and also we need to also build the appetite for our own content right. because there's too much foreign content on our tv channels yeah. so it makes it very hard for the local producer to compete right even locally mm-hmm. 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 yeah and so that's a policy that's a, a policy, policy that needs to be yes. and we've We've tried to have those conversations with those, those the powers that be. <laughs> it was right. Uh, uh, I tell you, the, the, the work that it is, but yeah, you know, there's I don't, For me, I don't understand where the apathy is coming from because mm. it seems like an insight, and honestly speaking, where some people are benefiting from the loopholes of our industry. Yes. Like if if local producers are not getting the opportunity, it means that someone is definitely taking advantage of the foreign content mm-hmm. and distributing heavy to uh, some of these TV channels. Yeah. For instance, just yesterday I was thinking through this same thing where I was watching a movie distributed on Netflix, mm-hmm. and who produced it? BBC. BBC has been producing a lot of animations and series and films and they are not just broadcasting it on their channels they are also going out and I was asking myself how many series or films has a GBC invested in we have GBC which is the peer of BBC why are we not able to raise funds from GBC to produce original content and, and globally appetizing. Uh, yes, yeah. you see, so it's, it's, it's something that needs to be tackled both from the private side and yeah. also the government side. Our problem really comes right deep from within. So we look at that and also build distribution machines around amongst ourselves. 
Thanks for joining us for part one of my conversation with Francis Brown. Please be sure to come back next week for part two of our conversation where Francis talks more about the cinema industry in Ghana, as well as his perspective on AI and how he spends his time when he's not being an animator. As always, you can catch us with new episodes at GlocalCitizensPod.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Please like, share, subscribe, leave us a review. We love to hear from you as well. So please share comments, etc. Until next time. Bye for now.